I'm Cheryl Clegg. I am a photographer and I am looking forward to exhibiting my work that I've done for the Racine Foundation, which is a nonprofit that has a clinic in rural, Le rural Leogon, Haiti. Uh, and it's a series of portraits of the community that the doctors serve. The clinic in Haiti that the Racine Foundation formed, they formed it in 2010 after the earthquake in Haiti that was very devastating. Many lives were lost. Uh, and I, ha I, I know one of the doctors who started the organization. And I said I'd love to go down and take pictures, and it took quite a few years um, for me to, to get it together and to go and to make sure I had a good place to stay and all that kind of thing. So there were a bunch of doctors going down, and I went down and I volunteered my time to take pictures basically for their website. but. When I was down, there was so much more going on that I wanted to work on some other things, which became this portrait series. Let me go back to how the project sort of originated while I was in Haiti. So I went down there to take pictures for the nonprofits, the nonprofit Racine Foundation's website. And inside the clinic, um, while things were very basic, there's a, a nurse still giving people injections, medicine, blood pressure, the basic things that, that we, I mean, I know I always took it for granted that we just have access to here. That's what was going on inside, and that's what I was taking pictures of. And they're pretty average photos, not a lot of emotion, where they have a different purpose. But what was outside the clinic were maybe 50 patients just waiting to see the doctors. Now mind you, when I was there the first time, well each time I go with a doctor, so the the locals like it when the the volunteer doctors are there. So so it could be an increase in patients for the day that they were gonna see. But what was outside, when I went outside, were people who were dressed up in their Sunday best. They were wearing hats and and fancy dresses and dress shoes and the, the, no, nobody was in shorts and a t-shirt, let's put it that way. And, and everybody had so much character in their, their faces. Um, and I went outside and I stood out. I had a couple cameras around my neck and it was obvious I was not from their, their uh, village. So I was talking to people and, and I would ask them if I could take their picture. Um, and, uh, and, and I went a different route on taking these. There's just so much character. I, want, I, I, I went back to a more basic approach and I took pictures with my DSLRs, my, my, my Canon camera and high file, uh, high res file, etc. And I also took pictures with my handy dandy iPhone. Um, and that's what all these are from. And they're from a very basic four, four iPhone, small file. But to me, I was going back to those days of film. I was going back to when you would take the picture and then I put them in the computer and, and I really didn't touch up much at all. There was no fixing this or fixing that. This pretty much right out of the camera, except for where I would bring out some detail um, in, in Photoshop. and. Uh, it, but the immediacy of me taking those pictures and I wasn't taking a hundred pictures, I was taking three or four of each person and that was it, and showing it to them helped them feel comfortable with me because there's a language barrier. So I, while my friend, I, I can speak French, but mind you it's 30 years old plus and it's not very good. They're speaking Creole. There's a little overlap in, in words, but I had to get them comfortable for me. And so I started using my phone and showing them what was there. And, um, and, it, and then I went back and to where I was staying, printed pictures, and I handed it out to people. So word got around that people had never had pictures of themselves before. They didn't have access. Um, and at the time, they, I think most people now have a phone down there that they will capture pictures, but at the time that wasn't the case. Um, and that was just a few years ago. That wasn't like yesterday, it was a few years ago, but uh, 
it was something new to them. So, and, and I had to build that rapport and building it was handing them a picture. And years before I had a Polaroid that I would take and I'd give it to people if there was a language barrier and say, this is what I'm doing. I shoot quite a variety of things. I've been in the Boston area now since uh, late 80s, I'm afraid to date myself. But basically I graduated from Rochester Institute of Technology moved to Boston with a truckload of furniture, no place to live, no job. I had a roommate though, and I started knocking on doors at commercial photographers and, um, and uh, worked for a few, then started my own business. I do commercial corporate advertising work. I've done work for household names, uh, a lot of retail. I do a lot of corporate work. I do some product work. And uh, always, for them, I do product, but I mostly deal with people, you know, taking their pictures. Let's go back to high school or, or even junior high, just preserving the moment, capturing an emotion. Now, way back when, not everyone was a photographer. Now everyone's a photographer. Everyone has a camera in their back pocket. But it was a way to, to just capture moments and preserve them, um, mostly for my family. Um, and of relatives and things and it just grew there was a lot of emotion a lot of satisfaction that when i was in a dark room i'd see the picture emerge and uh, it had an emotion to it so a lot of emotion in that then i went to school i studied at uh, rit and and i never thought i'd be doing commercial photography but that's what i that's how i pay my bills dramatic changes uh, from going through all the technical aspects of, of film and developing and making sure we have detail in every part of the image and, and working with different colors uh, and, and printing color, not all the time, mostly black and white, but the challenges with that to then suddenly, and it, it was a gradual jump, but in other ways it was a sudden jump. We're, we're ditching the film and we're going digital. And how do we make that work? How, and for me, it's always been, how do I make what I used to do in the dark room appear in the digital file. How, how do I do that? So I mean, now it's been, geez, close to 20 years maybe digital and pretty much that's all I shoot. I'd love to go back and shoot some film, but it's more cost effective right now to do digital, but um, lots of changes. And like I said before, now everyone's a photographer. You still need an eye, you still need to look at detail and you still need to work with your subject and and get get them to feel comfortable with you. Her name is Alexandra Amonia, I think, Alexandra, I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, she is about 77 in that picture. She's got a dress on, very dressed up, the hat and everything, and uh, she's almost blind. Um, I'm not sure the circumstances of why she has no vision, but she walked to the clinic on her own that day, down a road, dirt road, uh, not sure how she manages, but everyone's walking. And, uh, and I actually, I went back a couple, when I went back the next year, I tracked her down again, and I actually took more pictures, and I had more of a conversation with her, mind you, I have to have it with an interpreter. But she is one of those that's benefiting from having the clinic there because of her high blood pressure. And she said she has aches and pains in her knees and legs. And, um, but she was, she was very comfortable. And, and having said that, I was showing everyone the pictures. She saw it, but I'm sure she, she couldn't quite make it out. But she, was, she, was, uh, she had a lot of character, a lot of willingness to be in front of the camera and, and happy to be there. Her name is Nerland. Nerland Cassius, I believe is how you'd pronounce it. And she actually spoke English, which all of a sudden she started speaking to me in English. I'm like, you know English? She says, yes, yes. And she too, she was outside the clinic just waiting to be seen. She wanted to see the doctor. Her ailment was, I think she had a headache, really, honestly, that's what she said. But if you have no access to even ibuprofen or and and there's somebody there who can maybe say okay here take a little ibuprofen and makes her happy she ended up actually doing some translating 
uh, for the clinic, so she was employed. So she was was one of the is one of the beneficiaries of the clinic, both um, for healthcare as well as employment. And employment is very hard to find there. Um, she's very friendly, and again, she spoke English, and uh, and and very much take my picture. There was quite a bit of that after a while when it caught on. Take my picture. In this situation, most people were willing, it didn't matter their age, and that was sort of the beauty of what I saw outside, was this whole community that before this, before the Racine Foundation built this clinic in a sugar cane field, mind you, their only access to health care was, I'm gonna say like five or six miles away at a hospital, which doesn't sound like much, but if you don't have a car, the only way to get anywhere is walking and in the summer months it's extremely hot and you have a newborn and you can't get to the hospital it doesn't always end up the way that it does here where you give the newborn you know a little care so the whole series when i when i walked out of the clinic from taking pictures of the nurse nurses with blood pressure just things that we all see in doctors offices whatever um, when I walked outside and I saw this community of people, it's like, this is where the, and I started taking more and more of these pictures, like the faces of the Racine Foundation are the people that are benefiting from this care that the Racine Foundation doctors are providing that did not exist before uh, they built the clinic. It was sort of like a little light bulb went off, like, oh, that's great, I've got these pictures inside that are doing exactly what they wanted, but Let's do something more. Let's let's see if we can. And also, my thought was take these pictures of the the people, bring them back here for other people to see, and help raise awareness of the Racine Foundation. Chatted with him after I took that as well. Um, but he was a schoolboy. He was there to see see the doctors. Mom wanted him to get checked. Um, he's wearing a school outfit, which is just a yellow polo shirt, and just these amazing eyes, just amazing eyes um, that were speaking to me. And, uh, and I don't know, it's probably one of my favorites. Why is he looking up? Honestly, because I asked him to. So it, 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 I did ask him. Um, I asked him by showing him because he did not understand English and he was, his mother was very happy to have pictures of him and uh, I don't know, something about those eyes looking up, I've just really like that. There's the art aspect, which is on a couple levels. I mean, one, who knew that the iPhone could, could do what it could do? And like I said, that was an iPhone 4 that most of those were taken with. Um, and uh, for me, there was a magic moment in that that brought me back to the days of film. And to me, they have a more film quality to them, which I like, but being able to, to use that basic phone and no lighting or just using available light and getting the pictures to be 16 by 16 inches, I thought was quite remarkable. Um, so for me, there's, there's that aspect of it. There's a technical aspect of it. There's an emotional aspect of it with what each person in the picture brings and everyone's takeaway is going to be a little different because it's subjective we're all we all see different things um, and, and to raise awareness for the foundation hey we're and, and the Racine Foundation is always looking for volunteers any way to help and it could be something simple like half of the I have another series of the school kids that I've been working on from down there the kids don't have shoes they're wearing sh like their dad's shoes uh, and actually, my daughter collected all these shoes. We shipped them down. Like, is there a way that other people can help the nonprofit? And it does financially is great, but doesn't have to be finance. How else can we help them? The Racine Foundation runs on a shoestring, basically. It's a very small group of people that that keep it going, and it's uh, it's it's such a good thing that they're doing. Hi, I'm Lindy Eister, and I live in Hyde Park, Massachusetts, and I'm retired scientist and biologist and biology teacher. I grew up in Louisiana and also lived in South Carolina and Florida before I came to Massachusetts. I began photography as a child, so I remember 
probably in sixth or seventh grade, we, I don't know what, who in the family idea this was, but we blocked off the window in the bathroom and we turned it into a little dark room. And so we had little canisters and you put all the chemicals in and reel the film in. Uh, we didn't have a, a, an enlarger for a printer, but we had a contact printer. So the photographs would come out just the same size as the film. And uh, I don't remember being doing any photography seriously between that and when I did my master's degree on sea slugs, which are very brightly colored. And unfortunately, when you put them in preservative, they lose their colors uh, quickly. So I knew if I was going to need to have pictures of them, if I was going to need, if I was going to need to know the color pattern on the nudibranchs, I better take pictures of them. So I bought a camera. And so my very first camera had a macro lens. So even back then when I was in my 20s, I was interested in doing really close up photography so you could see all the details on the organisms. So I'm really interested in the diversity of the organisms. So all of these photographs were taken in my backyard, which is a, a garden probably the size of a small classroom. And it has a lot of different insects just because I have a lot of different types of plants. So different insects are attracted to different types of plants. And mostly I'm interested in just observing the insects in terms of their structure, looking at their behavior, and noticing that you can have a really high diversity of insects in your garden. You don't have to go to Costa Rica to experience diversity. You can just go sit outside. So after I was doing photography in middle school, I um, then did the photographs of nudibranchs when I was in graduate school, but when I was working on my doctorate, I was doing a lot of electron microscopy, which is really looking at things really, really closely, like subparts of subparts of the cell. And I did that for years. And so I didn't realize at the time that I was learning a lot of photography skills that would be useful for what I'm doing now. So I'm looking at, you know, when you're taking pictures of parts of cells and deciding where you're going to take the picture, uh, what makes a good design of the image on the sheet of paper. So I had years practicing that without realizing it. So when I started doing this looking closely, my garden project, I, I had all of that, all of those skills in there and were, was able to draw on them. So what I'm doing, I feel like is mostly science that happens to be artistic rather than considering myself an artist who does science. So, so I would say that the, the main goal of this project, besides all of the joy it brings me, the, the goal of sharing it is to get other people to look at all these details, hopefully be fascinated by them, to realize there's an enormous diversity of tiny life, or not all that tiny life, in their gardens, around, you know, in their sidewalks, all over the place, if they could just sit and look at it. So I would say if somebody else is interested in doing photography like this, the main thing they need to do is to know how to find and approach the insects and then to have a lens uh, called a macro lens. There's nothing special about the camera itself, but you just need a lens that will focus really closely. And even pocket cameras, little point and shoot cameras, have a setting on it uh, with a little flower for macro mode. And if you switch your camera into macro mode, you can, you can make close-up photographs. And there are many um, people that have awesome cell phones now that can take you know, great pictures, so you don't have to have a special camera to get started. So the other thing, besides having some kind of a camera with a macro lens, is to know how to approach the insects. And so um, for, all of, for almost all these pictures, I'm sitting on the ground. So here's the plant and here's the insect, and I'm just sitting right there looking at it. Uh, and I will sit and look at the plant for minutes, and I may not see the insects and then maybe one will start to move or one will fly in and land, and that's, that's when I start observing. But if the camera is in my lap at that point, and so I have to be able to get the camera up and take the picture of the insect. But if you do this, the insect's gonna, ah, and go away because, you know, it's, am I a predator or what? So what I teach the students to do is that you'll have the camera in your lap, but then if you're slowly moving just like this a little bit, the insect, insect tunes it out and thinks it's just like I'm a plant moving with the breeze 
and then if you very, very slowly like bring the camera up like this, and this may take several minutes, um, so that you're, you're ready to take the photograph as the insect is still moving around, but it's getting close enough that you can actually get a picture. And so I'm shooting all of this off tripod because the insects are moving around on the plant. Um, and because they're moving, you have to be able to move with it. So I don't use a tripod. Also, I'm shooting all of, all of these photographs without a flash, which means that you have to be able to adjust the uh, settings on the camera in order to get enough light in. And that can be difficult if a lot of insects are, are active at a time of day when it's not a lot of light. This first image is entitled Copper on White. And I should mention that I, I name the photographs only so that I can keep track of them, know, know which one I'm talking about, or if other people are looking at a particular photograph, they can tell me which one because of the name of it. Uh, this one is, uh, shows a butterfly sitting on one of our native plants, which is an aster. And it is never my goal to get people to learn to identify the insects. I just want them to find joy in looking at them. Um, however, if you're interested in butterflies, there are butterfly groups and you can join a butterfly group, people that are experts in butterflies. And there's probably 500 species of butterflies in the US. So you can go out and observe, you know, just focus on, ha, huh, focus, just looking at butterflies. Um, different color patterns on the top of the wings, other color patterns on the bottom of the wings. Uh, this happens to show the top of the wings, little blue spots and black spots on the orange. In this next picture, uh, you can see there's an acorn on the left, and then there are two acorn cups, and peeking over the edge of one is a little insect that was related to uh, bees and wasps. And I was able to get this picture this is on my back deck. If you look at the bottom of the, of the photograph, you can see that it looks like glass. That's the, the, the table on my deck. And then the acorns were sitting on the top of that because they fall out of the oak tree all the time. And the insect was crawling, uh, walking, I should say, walking all over these things. And at one point, it just came up over the, the back of the acorn cup. And uh, I got a picture of what looks like a really cute face. For many of the photographs that I take, it looks like the, something has happened in the background that it's black. Um, I don't Photoshop anything out. I don't Photoshop anything in. It just happens that my, my garden is so small that when I'm shooting toward the fence, the sunlight doesn't, doesn't uh, fall in that area of the yard, and so everything turns out black uh, in that area. This photo is called, I named it Last Tango because it looks like the two insects are dancing. If you look at the, the one on the right, the insect has uh, the right arm up and the left hand down. What's actually going on is that um, the insect on the right is a bug. It's a true bug. Um, a lot of people call insects bugs, but they're not, there really is something called a true bug. And the one on the right is a bug. The one on the left is a fly. Not that you need to know those names, but just so I can tell you what's happening in this story. So I'm sitting next to these flowers. Um, the flower is probably three to three inches in diameter, four inches in diameter, just to give you a scale of how big the insects are. And um, I turn to this one particular flower and I see the bug on the right is holding on to the fly. And if you look at the mouth parts of the bug, it's got this straw-like mouth part, which it's sticking into the fly and sucking it out its juices. So it's like it's having lunch and um, it would suck out the juice on the lower part of the, the fly and then flip the fly upside down and take juice out of the middle. And now it's sucking juice out of the top part of the fly. So you get to see a lot of animal behavior if you look closely. This project began as something that I had assigned to students, encouraging them to get outside with their cell phones and start taking pictures of um, insects in particular. And I think I, I would encourage any family to do that. If, uh, if you have little children that are home, for example, during a school break, get them to go outside and walk around and just look and see what you can find. Encourage the curiosity, don't suppress it, don't go, ooh, if they point out a spider, just go enjoy it. 
and you don't, some parents will say, but I don't know who the insects are. And it doesn't matter at all. You can just have the, the child describe it like, what do you see? Oh, how many legs does it have? Oh, look how pretty it is. And all those sorts of things. And um, that's what I really would encourage everybody to do is get outside more. It can be very relaxing, especially now that we're stressed by, you know, a lot of things happening on the planet. Mm. <laughs>